Hello, friends. This is Dr. Sitesh Roy. Um, I'm an allergist, immunologist, and asthma specialist here in Mumbai. Um, I was in practice in the US for about 11 years, following which I've been in India for the past nine years. And today we shall speak about asthma, allergy in the current scenario. Uh, as we are aware, um, we are in a pandemic situation around the globe. Uh, we're going to discuss the spread, the impact, the response, what it means for our children and our pediatric patients, and what the impact specifically has on children who have allergies and asthma. Uh, we will have time for some questions towards the end of the talk, so please stay tuned and send in your questions and we shall start responding to them once I get done with the presentation. So as we are aware, we are dealing with a beta coronavirus, which belongs to the coronavirus family. And the SARS-CoV-2 virus is actually 25 times bigger in size than the SARS virus. So assuming that it's a bigger virus, we would think that it would cause less problems when in reality, it is more infectious, which means its transmission and transmissibility is higher. Also, it is able to transmit in pre and asymptomatic stages, which was not seen with SARS and MERS, which you can see on the screen. And also, what we realize is that it is stable outside the human body, which becomes a very problematic situation. Also, it is stable at higher temperatures and humidity, which the previous viruses were not, they would not survive for very long. This really makes the SARS COVID-2 a much more virulent problem, as we shall see. This virus takes an entry into the body much like the previous SARS viruses through something called the angiotensin converting enzyme to the ACE2 receptors. Now, these receptors are very widely distributed in the human body with a very significant number of them in the type 2 alveolar cells in the lung, the esophagus, the upper stratified epithelium, the absorptive enterocytes from the ileum and colon, the cholangiocytes, the myocardial cells, the kidney proximal tubules, and also the bladder uroepithelial cells. Now, besides these areas, this, would, this does not mean that there are no receptors for it in the upper respiratory tract. There are pretty much all the areas of the body that get affected by this virus. This virus, which initially happened to be called the Wuhan virus, started there later on, it was called the novel coronavirus, and then subsequently changed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which we know it by now. First really recorded cases might have been around the middle of November, where some cases of what we call unusual pneumonia started showing up, which had the presentation like SARS. The report from the Chinese authorities to the WHO office in China was on December 31st. The first case outside China was on Jan 13th in Thailand. The Chinese officials finally confirmed human-to-human -human transmission, assuming that it was mostly as a zoonotic disease transmitted from bats or pangolins, as we know, to the meat of these animals to humans. Um, earlier, but human to human transmission was officially confirmed on the 21st. Subsequently, cases were reported from other parts of the world. The US now has the most number of cases, and their first case was on Jan 21st. So, within a span of um, hardly two months, we can see where it has gone now. And India reported its first case from a tourist returning on Jan 30th, and this was the case in Kerala. Where we stand today is at about 12,88,000 cases around the world. And we are at a very high number of deaths at almost 70,356. We also have to remember that 270,000 people have recovered from this disease. So we don't have to think of this as a totally fatal disease. And you might have seen some even WhatsApp going around that the number of deaths due to this, this disease, for example, in India per day, there are more people who will die in car accidents or in railway accidents than would from this disease. So keep everything in perspective because this is not meant to create panic or fear in the minds of people. Now it has involved more than 200 countries and the WHO has called it a pandemic already. 
when you look at the situation in india today um, officially the number of cases on the ministry of health and family welfare from where we get all our guidance reads at 3666 cases with 109 deaths giving a mortality rate of about 2.9% with about 291 patients recovered when we look at the same statistics for the us it's about 3337 933 cases with 9653 deaths giving a mortality rate of about 2.85% of which about um 7500 to um 17500 to have recovered so recognizing that this is a disease that is still in its rising phase these graphs are from india these graphs are from the us we can see that the confirmed cases the daily rise in the cases and the logarithmic scale we are lagging behind and that's a good thing what we do recognize is that with the introduction of the janta curfew and subsequently the lockdown there has been some reduction possibly in the speed with which the cases are increasing given that we are a country of 130 crore 130 crore people that there is still not that high of a case load yet within all these numbers if we focus on the pediatric cases one of the reviews from a chinese from the chinese center for disease control and prevention looking at 72314 positive cases showed that there were less than 1% pediatric cases now when we look at some of the data that is available in india of all the cases that have been positive the numbers range somewhere between 7 to 9% depending on the source of the data so children are affected and in children less than 10 years of age the numbers are less there are less than 1% when we look at kids between ages of 10 to 16 then the numbers are higher and they may go up to as i said 8 or 9% also in this data it was seen that 171 children approximate age 6.7 years age range be from one day mark my word one day to 15 years had tested positive fever was the presenting symptom in about 41.5% children at any time during the illness the other common findings were cough and pharyngeal edema also in some case reports it has been suggested that vomiting in children might have been present at, at an early stage 27% of the patients did not have any symptoms of infection or any radiologic picture of pneumonia when they tested positive because they were obviously being tested because either they had a parent or a mother or someone that they have been exposed to that had the case 12% of the patients had radiologic features of pneumonia but did not have any symptoms and three patients with coexisting illnesses had required intensive care support and invasive mechanical ventilation suggesting that the number of cases and the incidence of these diseases are especially a severe disease was low the most common radiologic finding was bilateral ground glass opacity on high resolution ct scan of the chest and this also was found to be more in the lower lobes of the lungs compared to the middle or the upper lobes there was in the case reports that were uh, studied from china one 10 month old child who had a complication of interception with a multi organ failure who died at 4 weeks so there was only a single death below the age of 1 that was reported in this large case series from the originally affected areas there haven't been too many other cases of deaths at least not from at least so far as we know but in the us on march 28th there was one infant who died due to covid 19 and subsequently a 7 week old baby in hartford connecticut who came into the uh, emergency room in an unresponsive state and following that on autopsy because of concerns uh, sars cov2 was detected to be positive suggesting that though most infected children have a mild course many of them have asymptomatic infection kids are certainly in the risk group not in the risk group for fatal infections but in the risk group for being sick the disease presentation in general so we know a lot about the adult disease presentation and i'll mark out the adult disease presentation and tell the differences in children subsequently 
So as I said, sometimes in the first one, two, three, or up to five days, which is a typical incubation period, though it can last up to 14 days, and in some case reports even up to 24 or 27 days, but the typical incubation period is five days, and in that the asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic cases can still transmit disease. In the upper respiratory symptom in adults, anosmia or loss of smell has been seen very interestingly, not really described in children. In children, a sore throat, and as I mentioned, pharyngeal edema has been described. GI manifestations seem to be less in children compared to adults. Adults tend to have a lot of loss of appetite, abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea, and uh, vomiting in some cases. But these symptoms tend to be less in children with some vomiting or nausea being noted. There are uh, reports of some body ache or myalgia. It's much more in adults, not so much described in children. But the classic symptoms still remain of fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Again, these would be cases that go into the moderate range and then potentially into the severe range requiring hospitalization. There have been some case reports of ocular symptoms as well. I shall also describe some dermatologic symptoms in the lat latter part of my presentation. Uh, cardiovascular complications have been seen in adults, including multi-organ failure, as has been described, all due to a cytokine storm, but it seems like this is not so commonly seen in children. Children tend not to show a picture like a cytokine storm and ARDS typically in general. So that is something that goes in favor of these children. Now, being asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic does bring up the concern that kids can be carriers of this disease and can infect the adults in the family and hence all the precautions that have been taken. With regards to the transmission of this disease, coughing and sneezing is the typical aerosol transmission. But micro aerosol droplets and even airborne transmission has been a concern. So even talking loudly, shouting, singing, maybe even just normal conversation. And that is why the distance of three feet being maintained between patients and doctors and also between family members may be an important thing wherever possible. Contact transmission through fomites and surfaces where the aerosols may land is also a concern because the uh, contact surface transmission, depending on areas like plastic or metal surfaces, the survival of the virus has been shown for up to sometimes even 72 hours, that is three days. But a typical uh, time frame of uh, a few hours for sure, survival for the virus outside the body is very well known. Obviously, direct contact can be a source of transmission. When it comes to fetal maternal or transplacental transmission, there were six cases in which babies were born to mothers who were uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive in China. And all of these babies had antibodies that were detected, some of IgG and IgM and some of only IgG. Uh, making it a tricky question whether there is transplacental transmission or were these babies later on infected, which would not give enough time for an antibody response. But interestingly, they were all negative when it came to the uh, RT-PCR test that would actually detect virus particles, the RNA particles of the virus from babies' bodies. So this is still an area of question. There has been one case that I have read in the news where a mother delivered a baby in a room where the child and the mother were kept in a room that had been occupied by a COVID-19 patient and subsequently both mother and child were positive. Details of the case are not available. So it clearly seems that babies also, and we had seen the Chinese data before where a one day old child was in that 171 cases that were seen. So recognizing this in order to stop the germs, the things that have been recommended such as social distancing, very thorough hand washing, avoiding contact with patients who are sick, um, avoiding gatherings. Uh, are, we are obviously in a lockdown situation which we really need to follow very carefully, uh, self-quarantine. And then if big areas and big groups of people are affected, then even geographic quarantining, which is what was done in Hubei province in China. 
once the case is identified the isolation of the case being our contact tracing which really are uh, healthcare uh, personnel are doing a great job with slowing down the epidemic uh, so that we don't have a high peak that overwhelms our medical systems and then mitigation of the cases become very very important what do these different words mean when we think of quarantine it means separation of individuals who are not yet ill but have been exposed to covid-19 and so have the potential of becoming ill isolation means separation of individuals who are ill and who would be suspected or confirmed of covid-19 for the cluster containment and the social distancing the measures key interventions to rapidly curtail the community transmission include closure of schools colleges and workplaces cancellation of mass gatherings advisory in public places cancellation of public transport and enforcement of geographic quarantine of this the closure of schools was done very early as you all are aware in many parts of the country and i think this was a very important move because the children may not fall very ill they may be carriers for the adults in the home and for the senior citizens and the grandparents or the elderly family members who may have other comorbid conditions and then become very very sick as a consequence this local transmission containment obviously requires very extensive contact tracing active search and containment zone all of which is being done by our governmental authorities and health authorities very well testing of all suspect cases and high risk contacts isolating the suspect and confirmed cases quarantining the contacts implementing social distancing intensive risk communication and then the frontliners our healthcare workers our doctors such as ourselves all of our brethren have to be given good protection and care as they perform the line of duty in the line of fire coming to when this all began i started getting a lot of calls from my patients who have allergies and asthma and because we know that cough wheezing breathlessness are also symptoms of asthma uh, many of them were concerned about their children what was happening to them and i do see adults also in my practice i do want to do medicine and within them i was getting calls from children parents children adults and they were all asking the same questions so while it has been said that among the low risk and high risk groups the high risk groups it has been suggested that people who have hypertension heart disease uh, who have diabetes mellitus who have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease mostly all apply to adults very rarely in children but also uh, those who have asthma and respiratory disease have been suggested as being problematic what we have to recognize is there is currently no evidence showing that there is increased infection rates in those with asthma in whatever studies have been done in the us or china and other parts of the world there is no indication that people with asthma will catch a sars cov2 virus more quickly than other people the concern is that if they have a existing inflammation in their lungs could it make the disease worse and that's where the all the concern and care has been provided and in the general recommendations people have been told that if you have um asthma or other lung conditions then you should be more cautious than other people this still holds true there have been several reports or concerns among people because they have read something that steroids are contraindicated in covid-19 disease you have to explain to your patients that this concern for steroids came from the systemic steroids the iv steroids that were being given to very critically ill patients in order to reduce their inflammatory cytokine disease and it was later on found that it didn't make a difference to the cytokine storm and the inflammation and it actually lowered their immunity and made them prone for other possible what we would call super infections and hence steroids got a bad rap with use with this disease in critically ill patients that does not mean that you need to tell your patients to reduce or stop their inhaled steroids the classic recommendations from the american academy of allergy as my immunology from the american college of allergy as my immunology and from european academy from everyone everywhere is that continue taking your controller medications do not stop them if you are on a low dose or a medium dose or a high dose inhaled steroid and your asthma is under good control 
it is most important to continue them to control your asthma well because if you stop them in the fear that the steroids may impair your immunity and make you more prone to SARS-CoV-2 for which there is no evidence then you actually put yourself at risk for an asthma exacerbation and guess what happens in an asthma exacerbation to get an asthma exacerbation you have to go into an urgent care facility or an emergency department because most clinics will not be able to evaluate you now and when you when patients will do that they might get exposed to other people there who are sick in the emergency room or urgent care and some of them may actually have the sars cov2 infection so they actually increase their risk by catching an infection that they didn't have to start with if they stopped their medication so a very clear message and a very a strong message to everyone who calls you and even in your practices for those of you who are doing telemedicine and following your patients and advising them as you should be is don't stop your uh, control of medications even if you have allergic rhinitis and you're on nasal steroids it is strongly recommended that they be continued if they are important and you have perennial symptoms for which they have been started or you have moderate to severe allergic rhinitis for which it has been started the patient has started it those do need to be continued interestingly also it has been noted on the quad ai website that the sars cov2 virus does not seem to cause asthma exacerbations so people have wondered could catching this virus trigger an asthma because we know that rhinovirus a common cold virus triggers asthma we know that influenza para influenza viruses can trigger asthma exacerbations interestingly sars cov2 does not trigger which means that the entire mechanism of this virus and how it affects the lungs and at how it affects the uh, cells in the lungs not the smooth muscle in the lung is all very different than what we see with other diseases whether it's in terms of inflammation whether it's in terms of the degree of mucus production in the airways etc it behave it is behaving differently and sars cov and mers cov also did not seem to cause asthma exacerbation so we have a track record with this that we can follow uh, by maintaining routine med- medications and good control of allergies and asthma the lungs will be best prepared should any infection or allergen lead to an exacerbation of asthma similarly the american college of allergy asthma and immunology also says that continuing and resuming your asthma routine to help control your symptoms is important uh, as needed short acting rescue medications can be used following the asthma action plan if it has been given which hopefully your patients do have is beneficial using good hand hygiene hand washing hand sanitizing maintaining distance using masks when we go out uh, social distancing all of these are very very important still for patients uh, if they have if any of your patients have follow up appointments then they need to call before they see you and it's very important to do telemedicine in the right format with the right Uh, legal procedures that have been recommended by our governmental authorities and still give them advice and maintain their care um you they you will get questions regarding medications dosages and also what happens if there is worsening of symptoms all of these need to be managed in an appropriate way when we look at lab testing whether it is kids or adults uh symptomatic individuals especially those who have an exposure history or positive contact all symptomatic contacts of confirmed cases all symptomatic healthcare workers any patient admitted with a severe um acute respiratory infection an influenza like illness asymptomatic direct and high risk contacts of confirmed cases should be tested once between day 5 and day 14 Uh, many of the patients who turn out to be negative on the initial rt pcr test may need to be tested after 5 days because sometimes there can be a delay in the appearance of the symptoms as we know and in the disease um recently just yesterday and day before yesterday um our icmr mm-hmm. has put out guidelines for antibody testing also so we will also hopefully in the near future have the rapid antibody tests available which can give us results very quickly what we have to realize is the nature of this disease and how it progresses so from that from the time of infection for the first 5 to 7 days 
quickly the rt pcr where the viral shedding is occurring and the viral particles or their rna can be picked up can really be positive after day 7 by when ig and production begins we, the antibody test start becoming positive so assuming that the patient had a 5 day incubation period by day 2 or 3 of symptoms preferably day 3 of symptoms is where the antibody test really start becoming relevant and igg comes by day 14 and so we have to be smart about what to test and when to test and recognize that no test is perfect because even the rt pcr diagnostics that are available in india both from local manufacturers and imported kits uh do have a 70% sensitivity and that is why the second test becomes so important and if you have a very high risk and a very high suspicious case then sometimes even a third time testing i was just doing a panel discussion with a panel that even had an infectious disease specialist yesterday and we got this question from several viewers on whether we should be doing uh, if we have a high risk case a very classic presentation but two of their nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs are negative what do we do the answer is do a third swab and also even consider doing the antibody test when they are available there are as i mentioned almost seven different kits that have been approved uh, or validated as per national virology institute in pune national institute of virology pune so these will hopefully start getting available in the near future uh for cases where containment zone or large migration or evacuation centers where there are people coming in with influenza like illnesses the icmr guidelines are very clear that they can start possibly with a rapid antibody test if it's positive then we know it's probable covid 19 they get their clinical assessment or get hospitalized if they have significant symptoms or are treated in home isolation with all precautions if their antibody test is negative then the rt pcr is done which if positive confirms them to be a case and then the same protocol if it's negative and they probably have a non covid 19 infection if the pcr is not done and it's only an antibody test that has been done it may need repeated again and if it's negative again after 10 days then we can assume it's not a, a covid 19 infection and if it is positive after 10 days then it's a probable covid 19 but you would still want to do an rt pcr and try to follow the gold standard of confirmation for the test uh, these are some very important numbers that all of us physicians should be having and our patients also can utilize when needed there is a helpline number for our ministry of health and family welfare there are toll free number there are email ids and for doctors who are managing uh severe covid cases and need guidance uh, at aims institute in delhi there is a helpline that has been created or even through the telemedicine network they can seek guidance uh, for their cases so these are very helpful for us physicians when we are at the front line taking care of patients with all the proper ppe that would be recommended for us some important points to take care when you are taking care of asthma patients we want to avoid aerosol generating procedures in the clinic unless we are using full ppe uh, such as nebulizations are known to create that if anyone tries to do like a throat swab or anything the patient can cough or gag or sneeze uh, so these are cases in which you want to have full protection so these are best done at centers that are designed for managing covid 19 cases uh, if you had an and no option and you had to give a bronchodilator or some treatment in the clinic setting with all the precautions you would prefer to use a meter dose inhaler with a spacer um, avoiding throat examination has been suggested by some people because sometimes if you use a tongue gel and you depress the tongue the person may gag and cough especially a child uh, so you want to be careful with that and then telemedicine and taking all the what i would call pre screening steps so making sure that the patient or knows to call before they come if they do have symptoms directing them to the right place for testing and care according to the networks in your area there are fever clinics that have come up in many parts of the country we certainly have them in mumbai knowing where they are is very beneficial for your practice uh, knowing where these children would be best taken care of and then obviously taking all the precaution and protection for us as frontline caregivers those of you who are seeing patients uh, using an n95 mask preferably with a surgical mask on top of it using goggles 
eyewear protection, headgear, the full body cover, and preferably even uh, foot covers would be the ideal way to manage along with gloves, preferably double layer gloves, double gloves. Uh, some of the tricky issues that we are facing, as I said, 6 to 12% of the transmission occurs in the first three days of disease where symptoms are not yet present. So we have to have a very high level of suspicion and recognize that even if an adult in the family had the infection, the kid may have been the place from where they got. So avoiding some of the ways that kids can catch this disease becomes very important. The home um, lockdown and being inside the home is a very classic example. Um, recognizing that some cases have masqueraded like diseases like dengue. There have been, this was obviously an adult patient who came with skin rash, petechia, and a low platelet count, but subsequently because of persistent um, symptoms, uh, eventually developed a fever and was tested found to have. So there are some cutaneous manifestations of this disease, which include having uh, skin eruptions, much like any other viral infection may give you an exanthem. This virus can also give that, so recognize that red rashes, uh, urticaria, uh, and one case that had even chickenpox like vesicles, these were mostly from adult data. We don't have very clear pediatric data for these kind of presentations, but if it can happen in an adult, the virus clearly is not following any race, color, creed, borders, ages. It's not following any rules or regulations, so we have to be aware of these things and look at the child in the entire picture. Um, small blood vessel occlusion, and you may have even seen certain thoughts about uh, thrombosis as one of the ways by which even the lower respiratory symptoms and dyspnea is occurring. Small blood vessel occlusion, giving petechiae bruises, transient livioid eruptions have been described in Italy, they've been described in the US, they have described in China. And then obviously, if drugs have been used, acute drug reactions need to be in the entire spay. The key to all of this is don't panic. We have been told to stay home, so we do stay safe, stay informed. Uh, there are many programs like this going on. I can't say that this is the only program and it has all the information you need. There's a lot of stuff that I haven't covered. There could be series of these kind of lectures that could be done if I go into the immunologic aspects and the past uh, coronavirus aspects and everything else. And remember that this too shall pass. If any of you all need to connect with me, I do have a Telegram group called Dr. Allergy Times. I have a YouTube channel on which I put videos from time to time. These are some of my email and contact numbers through which you all can get in touch with me. At this point of time, I am going to start looking at the questions that you are getting. And um, see what kind of um, queries we may have. कुछ नहीं मैंने भी आज दोपहर में आलू पिज़्ज़ा बनाया था हाँ सर प्लीज टेक द क्वेश्चंस नाउ यू कैन या where would I be able to see it's them on WhatsApp. Uh, on WhatsApp? You have sent them. Okay. So one of the questions to Dr. Minakshi Mitra is how do you differentiate between mild cases from common cold or a bacterial URI? So this is a very relevant and important question. When there is a mild cold or typical URI uh, and a patient has sneezing and runny nose. Sneezing and runny nose are two symptoms that have not been described to be a part of SARS-CoV-2 infections. Mm. 
if you see rati knows and sneeze that you can very safely assume it is either some other virus or it's an allergy or some other trigger that is causing it so that's your first indication the second thing is if you're having a bacterial upper respiratory tract infection then seeing pure nasal discharge pure nasal discharge has not been again something that has been discussed with sars cov2 sars cov2 initially may show some upper respiratory symptoms but largely causes all its problems by affecting the lower respiratory tract so the duration of the symptoms the nature of the symptoms the type of presentation knowing that patient from before whether they have seasonal allergies they have perennial allergies they have a history of recurrent upper respiratory tract infection so in the phase of very detailed history very detailed um um communication with the parent uh, recognizing what the presentation is all of that can make very big difference in identifying whether this is really a sars cov2 infection or is this a common cold or an allergic rhinitis or an allergic rhinosinusitis uh, that is developing uh, you in these days you do have to keep the suspicion high if you have the slightest fear or indication that this could be a case of uh, of of the concern, of the concerning type of sars cov2 covid-19 infection don't hesitate to refer for testing and evaluate the child because you need far safer than being sorry not having evaluated uh, so that's a bit of a, a, a general advice that i would give hope that answers your question uh the next thing that we have um a uh, use of ivermectin in pediatrics has it been tried anywhere dr anil vadak uh, inquires i believe there are some trials that have begun looking at this thing and it's going to be interesting on what it shows because uh, even when you look at the data with toxic chloroquine interestingly it has anti platelet properties it has anti thrombotic properties plus it has the usual properties by which it can prevent the entry of virus into the cell so i think that ivermectin will be something that we really have to follow the studies to know what its role might be in terms of these treatments um so someone had, uh, dr anil again has asked what is the difference between sars virus rna and covid rna is there a difference regarding treatment also so from the literature that i have reviewed in virology circles and in the immunology circles there is up to a 70% similarity between the rna of this but there are some very significant differences in some key areas there have been some even have said there has been 90% difference Uh, the similarity but there is that 10 20 or 30 percent differences which is making it highly infectious highly transmissible um, having a greater survival outside the body uh, there were some rumors at one point of time that there are some segments of the covid 19 virus that almost look like an herpes virus uh, this is still unverified data i would not trust or believe that but clearly a lot is being looked at but i would do on the positive side is it seems like and this was data put out from the icmr early on they were looking at that samples from around the world that had been taken from the several centers for disease control and indian patients the indian patients seem the the virus seems to be slightly mutated and different here uh, probably in our benefit and also there seems to be a micro rna of a specific type that can potentially be a blockage the entry of the viral particles into our cells and both of these may make uh, indian cases minor and potentially also less people getting affected uh, but these all still things that require a lot of further evaluation and study dr kureshi from uh, kashmir asks sir we shall be getting cotton fluffs in kashmir in some days so popular trees i'm well aware of that i've seen the entire dali covered with it when i've visited there in the past uh, that remain flying in the air uh, for a few months uh, they are not open though but can this uh, potentially carry or uh, the rest of the question got cut and i would request the 
post please uh, enlarge that question and send it to me if possible uh, but i think what you're asking me is can those particles carry the virus uh, a very tough questions to answer dr kaha nobody knows we know that from the studies coming out of japan that potentially this virus can stay in other parts of the world that potentially this virus can stay airborne for a couple of hours and hence opening the windows opening the doors letting air circulate becomes very important now can the viral particles sit on the pollen and then get transmitted that's what you're asking me and i don't know if that's the question i'm trying to see if the uh, team has sent me the question further um i have not received it uh, we don't know it seems like in live biology particles like in food it doesn't seem to have a very long survival so i would assume the pollen grains it will hopefully not have a very high survival but i would say that the allergy case is increasing and with the popular indicating that there are other pollen which are smaller in size invisible to the human eye and cause symptoms so be aware of that burst type pollen and those kind of pollen are uh, differentiating between the allergic rhinitis cases and the cases of actually sars cov2 is going to be important and i think this is really an evolving area that we don't have all the answers for but my suspicion is i don't think these particles are going to carry much um the next question comes from uh, dr akshay he says if the sensitivity is 70% then why do we give so much importance to testing why don't we restrict it to the end of 14 days of the individual is asymptomatic actually in certain parts of the world the testing is not ready this is what they're doing in fact some of my colleagues in america were at the front line emergency room caregivers they are saying that when they didn't have their test kits even though they knew that this case was a patient who could possibly be positive with the test when they didn't have kits they were reserving the kits for the severe cases for the ones who would require hospitalization the ones that were milder for low risk patients young people below the age of 50 and say children fall into low risk category for the most part unless they have other comorbid conditions the kid has other diseases that they are facing and are not troubled with then it's a different issue so in those cases they are actually just told that you stay home uh, self uh, you know in isolation even away as much as possible from the rest of the family only one caregiver takes care of the child does all the precautions whether it's an adult uh certainly that is something that can be done so testing uh, has its own especially for contact tracing and everything really it makes sense for the community transmission and in white press transmission uh testing can only help uh, but it doesn't become mandatory in the very mild cases um uh, any load of hydroxychloroquine in the pediatric patient uh, dr neera charma asked this uh again uncharted territory okay we know that hydroxychloroquine has been used in pediatric rheumatology patients um sle used due to rheumatoid arthritis so there are indications we know it can be used uh 4 to 6 mg per kg body weight we know at something a dose of 400 and 200 Uh, but really this is an area that i don't have an answer for i actually looked it up even one hour before i went live to see if anything had been published anywhere and there really is it and i think that kids are not getting that sick they are not going into um into that severe phase but if they do and you had to use with the right precautions with the right counseling to the parents the right kind of uh recommendations to the parents whether it's using azithromycin whether it is using hydroxychloroquine whether it is using any of the other case, cases when you're up against a severe case and you're trying to save someone's life you just have to have a very open conversation with the family and do what is required in those situations the next question that has come in um and does uh, anemophilus pollen dispersal have risk of carrying virus i think i already answered that i don't think it does Um, I don't think that live biological material uh, could carry the virus for very long, but certainly, you know, uh, today, as of today, yesterday, Center for Disease Control in America also said that every live human being who goes outside should be wearing a mask, even if it is a double-layered cloth mask that you have stitched at home. You should be using it. Okay, this is USCDC. not made up information 
So where we were originally telling people that wear a mask if you are a patient, wear a mask if you have respiratory symptoms, wear a mask if you're a healthcare provider, wear a mask if you are uh, in contact with someone who has been diagnosed or is quarantined because they have risk of care. Now it's been said everyone wear a mask. Now if everyone wears a mask, even if it's a, a triple layer surgical mask or a double layer cloth mask that can be washed and reused. I think that we will all be safe and we will all be careful. And even if the pollen carries it, the pollen can't go through that mask. So I think we'll be safe. Um, certainly hand washing and all the other things, hand sanitizing, social distancing, all that still uh, is very, very important. So I think we have the last few minutes. Uh, if there are any further questions, please feel free to send it to us. Um, There's a question from Dr. Sampat Kiyare regarding the role of XEQ in adults and pediatric. Answer that. Um, have I been muted by the host? Hello. It's on, sir. Okay. Um, Dr. Sampat, uh, what has been found is that uh, HCQ clearly has a role in treatment for adults. Uh, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and ICMR have come out with guidelines for prophylaxis for healthcare professionals who are in active duty facing these cases. Uh, prophylaxis guidelines have been given. Um, also for uh, patients who are in contact or have been in what we call high risk patients in contact, there have been prophylactic guidelines that have been given. Uh, there is a certain amount of physician decision making beyond that if it has to be used. As I said in pediatrics, uh, we really don't have that much experience to say, but if you are dealing with a, a high risk case and you can make a strong case for using it, it would be on a case by case basis, it would be off label use, uh, but it would be something that you could consider doing uh, if you feel that the case warrants it. Um, Akshay Balaka again asks, there are a lot of announcements that contact with pet animals are safe. Can we be sure? Uh, yes, um, pet animals do not carry SARS-CoV-2 virus. I think there's enough data. I think there are pet owners in America, Italy and other parts of the world. There are probably in India also in terms of cats and dogs I'm talking. Uh, there has been one case report from South Korea where a gentleman got SARS-CoV-2 infection, COVID-19, gave it to their pet dog. The dog's viral shedding was so low that they felt he could never transmit it to anyone else. Um, and also, he had no symptoms of being sick. There was a case of a woman in America who gave it to her pet cat. Same story, very low viral titers. Cat was not sick, didn't seem to transmit. Uh, I would say that we pose a bigger threat to our pets right now than our pets pose to us in terms of transmission. So they are safe, but we, I would still strongly say that wash your hands thoroughly even after you pet or play with animals or come in contact with them. I'm saying cats, dogs, domesticated animals. I'm not talking about wild animals. Wild and exotic animals, please stay away from. You know where this all began from, okay? So... Um, we should take all precautions, use thorough soap and water, hand washing 20 seconds, greater than 60% alcohol, 70% alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, uh, thorough sanitizing of surfaces, all those things if we have uh, pets in our homes and we should use that precaution, even if we don't have pets in our homes, all of those are still very valid uh, things that we need to do. Uh, thank you, Dr. Akshay, for uh, appreciating the presentation and the messages. I uh, appreciate doing this, and thanks to the uh, CIPLA team for uh, arranging this. Um, I think we are done with the questions for now. Um, 
if there are others you can certainly connect with me i had shown you all my uh, site earlier wherein you all can get in touch with me um, i shall just post it up once again um and do feel free to get in touch or connect in other ways um and take care stay safe take care of yourself first take care of your family because if we are safe then everyone is safe um i think finally the entire country is seeing the value of healthcare professionals like they have never done before the responsibilities on us to give them the right messages to do our due diligence to not spread any kind of rumors give real scientific advice and as i said take care of yourselves and take care of your families and everyone around you and then obviously certainly be there for your patients also god bless uh, take care have a good night thank you